There we go. Hey guys, Alex William Alexander Williamson here with the Secret History Living Inside Your Aquarium. Uh, how are you guys doing today? I want to talk about a couple different things, but mostly we're going to focus on breeding fish because it's a perfect time of year to be breeding fish, especially if you got some outdoor spots. Um, if you could use, I mean, you can use everything from a Tupperware container to like yogurt cups to get this thing uh, to get fish breeding. And um, you know, a really interesting channel that I'm going to give a shout out to, and I can probably type a link into is Dexter's World, and he lives in the Philippines. Hey guys, welcome on in, Vi and Betsy. Um, he lives in the Philippines, his channel's called Dexter's World, and he just lives in 9,500 degree heat, and he breeds goldfish and shrimp and, uh, um, you know, bettas and all sorts of stuff for a fish shop, but he does it without electricity and using nature for a lot of it and using things like Coke bottles and things like that. Um, just if you want to see ingenuity and working with uh, that is an awesome channel. Hold on, let me turn off my alerts. I always forget to do that. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, so, today, let's take a look at the first tank. I'm going to be talking about uh, types of breeding. So where I would start this is with easy types of breeding. And let me give you, uh, oh, it's Dexter's World is the name of the channel, if you missed that. Dexter's World. He's Filipino. He speaks Tagalog and English. Uh, most of his videos are in English. And uh yeah, it's an interesting channel to see like how they barter there. It's completely different than our fish business, but it's important to know because also when you see how diseases and things could spread, um, basically you get a really good sense of like in Indonesia where we buy our stuff from on farms and things, how and why you should quarantine your stuff. Uh, new subscriber, Jess Tanks, well thank you, I'm glad you enjoy it, you subscribed at a tough time for me right now, um, and, uh, in that I just got hit by lightning, but if you like the channel, um, if you like the channel now, just wait until I recover and uh, have my wits about me a little more. I wanted to show off, speaking of LR Bretts in the comment there, uh, I put some itsy bitsy day old shrimp in here just to see if they would survive, and they have, at least one has here. Uh, so we've got blue shrimp living in here, which is good. I also have a couple green jade adults in here. Um, but let me just show you my list quickly so you get an idea of what we're going to discuss. So, and feel free to interrupt me at any time. But on some scratch paper, this is my easy to hard list. The left side is easier fish and the right side is harder fish to breed. And then down here are just some different uh, notes that I was gonna talk about, so don't worry about those. But on the easiest side, we've got guppies, endlers, mollies, swordtails, platies, uh, basically all of the live bears. And as you can see in here, a lot of these babies are live bear babies. I don't have too many, if any, live bear adults in here because I just let them grow out in here with these celestial pearls which are actually going to be on the list uh, as kind of a medium uh, difficulty to breed and I'll go over some techniques because each of these skill levels I would say has different techniques for breeding and they're fairly similar and that's what makes them difficult. Um, the details change, but you probably, you know, you'll get a, you'll get an idea. So for live bears, what you want to do is you want to pick your favorite live bears. Uh, if you've got females like endlers here or guppies, you can't really tell the difference here. Hey, Patricia, um, basically you pick the ones that you like the best and, uh, then you decide that they're going to be your you pick one male or two males that you really like this is the male that i really like and you wait for them to get impregnated and the simplest way to do this is you literally just leave enough plants or make some homemade mops 
And uh, basically, as long as there's enough areas for them to hide, they won't all get eaten. Now, you can see here, there's some babies down at the bottom. But in this tank, they tend to get eaten. So I look for real pregnant females, and then I move them. Now the Danios, these are fire ring Danios, and I just added these. I just got a school of these, a little one. And I really love these. The subtle beauty of these is awesome. Plus when they eat or when they're spawning, they turn really beautiful, brighter colors and stuff. They are a little bigger than most nano things. Now, while we're on that same subject, let's talk about Neocaridina shrimp. Because Neocaridina shrimp, they need just about the same uh, conditions as live bears in that you give them places to hide... And you can look at my older videos to try to find what I mean by that. Rock piles and uh, grasses and plants that are um, uh, like guppy grass back in there, that tangle. Things that fish can't just plow their way into and eat. And right now, a couple of these shrimp are actually pregnant in here. Now, most will get eaten in a colony st st style, but, but, uh, but some will survive. And this is true with all live bears and Neocaridina shrimp, whether that's red cherry shrimp or blue dream shrimp. Um, that's true. And in this tank, it's not even as thick as you would want it, ideally, for them to survive. You really want hiding spots where the fish can't get, like stone rock piles, like in here where the shrimp babies can hide until they're about a quarter of an inch to a half inch. So that's... That's the, the, the first level of difficulty. And in here, I keep my males that I'm not breeding, uh, but that are potentials. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome. Come on in. Also, you're going to see the next step in breeding, which is called a mop. Um, we'll get into that more soon. But basically, in this tank, this is so dense down here that any number of these tetras could give birth in this tank and spawn and they do but they're getting eaten the babies are getting eaten but if i scooped all these fish out of here overnight and just let it be an empty fish tank i would probably have eggs from three or four different species so that's the next easiest way to deal with breeding uh, if you have that luxury and you have all these plants and things and enough males and females. Um, but yeah, so let's see here. So next we're going to go to um, back over to here real quick just because I wanted to show. If you want to breed shrimp, uh, you know, cherry shrimp and blue dream shrimp, yellow sakura shrimp, Riley shrimp or really shrimp, um, anything that's non-caridina, if you want to breed them, this is the setup you want. You want it thick enough so that when I, when I put my finger in here, basically there should be fish that come streaming out. Yep, so there's babies that are coming out. And down in here, there should be adults that come out. Yep, here comes more adults. So there should be lots of hiding spots, and ideally these you see these uh, roots that don't look the prettiest, and some plants are even growing back down on themselves. Um, basically, that is what you want, and this guy is in danger of getting eaten, unfortunately. Uh, maybe by one of these guys? I don't know. We'll see. So right now in here we have both CPD, erythromicron, and uh, Endler babies. So I put, oh, and uh, Reticulatus, which I'll show you later. But you see the yellow, little yellow guy with the blue eyeball there that won't focus? That is a ret rainbow fish, a Reticulatus, a Pseudomagill Reticulatus. Okay, another question is, any natural ways to raise GH? I'm glad you asked, yes. You can add crushed coral, that'll add calcium, GH, and it'll raise your TDS, which is similar to your GH. Um, also, you can add um, shells, so just allowing more shelled animals to die in your tank. 
Um, you'll see if you don't have enough, basically, uh, unless you have a tester, because all of your um, snails will have clear or white funky shells that look like toenail fungus or something gross. Whereas if they look like this, you've got enough. When you see that clarity in a lot of species of like ram's horns or pond snails, it means you're close to needing more, but you've probably got a little bit. Um, also, the food you feed makes a big difference, so that's another thing you could do. Um, let me just take a look here. Hey, fish fam. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see everybody in here. Don't forget to like, subscribe if you haven't done those things. I'm really excited. Uh, how is your lightning thing going? Um, for those of you who don't know, I'll go over it real quick because I don't want to just whine about lightning. I was hit by lightning. Um, I have a bunch of things going on right now. So right now, this channel, any fishy stuff I'm up to is coming through Patreon and Super Chats because... Uh, I promised at the beginning of those things legally that I would be using the money to improve the channel, whether that's new cameras, new whatever. Um, but there's a GoFundMe link also, and I never thought I'd be promoting that. But I'm looking down the barrel of probably thirty to fifty thousand dollars in the long run of potential work that needs to be done. Um, I still, right now, I've just taken a big rest and I woke up very late and I can talk really well, but later in the afternoon I will have my words will be all scrambled. I'll probably be confused and my wife has to put me down for a nap and change my diaper. <laughs> Joking about the diaper. Um, the, let's see here. Do you know anything about the yellow shrimp? Yellow shrimp are, I would say, I have... A little bit of knowledge, they seem to grow faster than most other varieties. I don't know if that's just because they've been bred a certain way in the line, but they seem to grow quicker uh, or more quickly. And also, they gain color later, whereas some, like red shrimp, you can tell really early if they're going to be uh, striped or blotchy or what the deal will be. Also, you really want to cull yellow shrimp by the time they're of breeding age. Get those males for sure out of there that are like yellow, that are just like uh, manila envelope color. Okay, and then also X Blister had a question a while back. How often do you top off? I drip my top for my red cherry shrimp about once a week, and I think the shrimp are dying because of the frequent top-offs. No, you know, I don't think that they would... Oh my gosh, Betsy, thank you so much for, for the super chat. So Betsy has a super chat of $10. That means a lot to me. I mean, that's money towards a light, that's money towards more breeding stuff, and stuff that I can share with you guys. Because I'm going to be trapped at home for a while. I'm probably going to need for sure one back surgery. Maybe two. Hopefully not. But I could need some sort of internal surgery if my blood tests come back. That uh, the lightning hit my organs and cut a path uh, through them. But hopefully that's not the case. Uh, I don't want to get too gross. But urine has been really dark and so that's a sign that there could be an excess of waste from the kidneys uh so hopefully that's not um yeah but the thing you guys can do definitely helps is just keep watching the channel take care of your fish share with what you have and or share you know share with the group share with each other the knowledge you have and help each other out. So let's get on to the next stage of breeding. So the next stage of breeding, I'm going to say is plecos. They're not necessarily nano fish, but here's a big old Mr. Grandpa Pleco. And he is huge. And yes, I have, let's, let's look at the list again for those of you who may have missed it. Tilapia Store, hello. For those of you watching, please visit Tilapia Store if there's certain things you want, like native catfish and things like that. He's got lots of stuff. Um, that's tilapiastore.com out of Florida, I believe, right? Florida? Um, but so yeah, these are all live bears and neocaridina shrimp. Now, I put neocaridina shrimp on the easy list 
Because in theory, if you have a cycled tank and it's planted and you give them wood and you feed them, they should just reproduce on their own. You shouldn't have to do much. I change the water every couple of weeks. Every two or three weeks I change the water. And the main thing is not to overfeed them because overfeeding them causes planaria and hydra and other nasties. Let's see, in my uh, here is another in my uh, cherry red tank. These are from Lucas Bretts. Um, I think, let's see, are there hydra in here? I was trying to get rid of them. Um, I would love to hear more about the Cory Cats as well. Yeah, I will let you know. Uh, we're going down the list. But these guys, while we're looking at them, like the Blue Bolts and stuff, they are definitely harder to breed. They're the next level up in that they really need specific pH and temperature and wood. And right now this tank has undergone... Uh, I just cleaned it, and so it, I need to, like dust everything off now that like it plumed up into the air uh but you can see a hydra right right here and so i encourage you even if you don't love shrimp um here's a hydra you see it looks like a sea anemone well those are poison barbs and it can leave and wiggle like like a mosquito larva and grab on to baby shrimp and sting the heck out of them uh, this tank used to have a lot of baby, um, a lot of baby shrimp in it, and now it's really missing out on some. Part of that's due to planaria, part of it, I don't know if it's just, um, how hot it's been has gotten their water temperature instead of 72 degrees. We're pushing, like, 80 in the tank, and, uh, yeah, uh fun to breed mine have bred every two weeks yeah if you want to breed neocaridina i heavily heavily recommend you get t 10 to 12 uh shrimp like these are beautiful these are lucas brett's blue dreams they're just incredibly beautiful fish or shrimp um really blue and you can see i have babies of all different ages all throughout the tank so even though i've lost some adults and um Let's see. I don't even know where the adults are. They're probably all hiding because it's hot. Um, you know, they will rebound if you give them what they want. Now, while we're here looking at shrimp, uh, we're really up close, and I know it looks gross, but you see all the little... Let's Can we see them? Uh, the little things moving around, the little bugs. And we're zoomed in really close. Like, these are super teeny like where is this that's a baby sh these are baby shrimp here and these are bugs so those shrimp uh are those little seed shrimp and copepods and things like that uh, by the way here goes a babalti shrimp which are even more difficult to keep alive to breed to adulthood come on focus they're the color changing indian ones all the adults of those, unfortunately, passed away in my care. Probably user error. But when you're getting shrimp, it really helps to get them from locally sourced areas or places with either hard or soft water that's most similar to you. Because if it's hard water and it goes to soft water, there's a good chance that they're having a hard time adjusting and the eggs might be too uh hardly like they they may have too much calcium and then they don't hatch because they're stuck um spider like things in my tank on plants jumping around only seen them once or twice those are probably some sort of copepod probably similar to hydra uh there are different kinds of hydra there are green ones green ones i've noticed give me the most trouble whereas these are more passive and they're more like sea anemones and they just wait they don't one won't kill a shrimp or anything, a baby shrimp, but getting stung over and over and over will. So here you can see I have some mix. It's probably one of the babies from this blue bolt, just not fully colored yet. Um, but the reason I'm showing you so much on these shrimp tanks is because... When you zoom back out, and by the way, I've got uh, some caradina. The next easiest caradina, I would say, are either tiger shrimp or uh, 
or crystal red shrimp because they've been um, monkeyed with a lot for a stable line. They have a lot of other shrimp DNA in them uh, that makes them much more stable. Plus, um, they're a little bit interesting to watch. You won't be able to tell as easily when they're pregnant. Um, for instance, this female is pregnant, but you can't tell because they have these sidewall guards that hide it really well. Um, any advice, doses dog dewormer for planaria? Yeah, so when I have really bad planaria, I will use, uh, like a, a dewormer for dogs, and I will use, like, a quarter of a dose for a dog out of, like, a 10 milligram thing. I'm trying to see if I still have the container right here handy. Um, but... I use just a little bit. Also, you can get bags of coral and things places, but I use coral frequently for a little hardness. The the caradinas need KH a little bit, and they need GH barely, whereas the neocaradina need some GH. And from what I've found, I've kept them in 500 TDS. Like, they've been able to, as long as you don't throw them straight in, they're able to survive in things way outside of what it says needs to be their comfort zone. Um, planaria are not that bad. Um, Jesse's tanks, yeah, your TDS being 132, that's great. You could have, you could easily keep uh, Caradina in there, I would guess. Mine is around, well, let's find out what it is right now. I added... Um, I haven't lost a single adult, uh, these are from Flip Aquatic, all the adult Caradinas in here, um, and I haven't lost a single one, but I've raised the TDS slowly, and it looks like we're, we're playing right around 150 here at this, and that's a little high, but, you know, whatever. Uh, let's see the Neo Caradina tank. Ironic. Oh, no, it's 153. So I kind of keep them right around that range if I can. Um, and the babies are much smaller on Caradina shrimp. Now, so I wanted to show this tank because you see the algae and stuff. Don't scrub that off. You see how there's leaves that are decaying and stuff? Don't mess with that. You see all the little critters in the in the... This is bright well soil, which lowers the pH to like 6.5 because mine comes out of the tap at like 7.2. So a lower pH for crystals and for um, caradina is good. Not It doesn't matter for the neocaradinas as much. I mean, they, they like about neutral and maybe 200 TDS is like where their chill zone is. But they can withstand quite a bit now because of all the breeding of the lines to stabilize things. So, why do I keep these tanks like this? With dirty, with snails, with algae, with little things floating up top? Well, it's because I will take my itsy bitsy teeny weeny. You see these? These are Pacific blue eyes which are uh also known as well where'd they go they're teeny little fries but they are uh i'm forgetting the name i'm sorry guys that's part of what the lightning injury has done is it's screwed up my memory it's kind of gelled things around but in this tank i have uh the the leopard rainbows from lucas brett's that i'm having experiment on where I've mixed them with some old school endlers like black bars and stuff and we're seeing what traits are dominant. I'm kind of keeping track of that. Also in here we have, uh, I was going to go over it, but we had, um, you know, we have, there's one of the fry from the wild mixed with the leopard. And the wild is winning out over the genetics of of uh in intentionally bred like big time uh lamp eye killifish is what these are called sorry these blue ones these two blue ones 
But I raise them from skinnier than an eyelash, and I just throw them down in here. Sometimes I even just take eggs, and I'll throw them here. If I have little eggs from a mop or something, like these Aru2s, I would say they are probably in the, if we look at this, I would say Pseudomagills, they're really easy to get to lay eggs. I'm going to put them in the moderate category uh, here. Pseudomagill, because some of these are really easy, like Daniels and things. They'll lay a million eggs, but they'll eat them all, and then it's a matter of keeping them from predating on their own eggs as well as letting the eggs stay at the exact same temperature, which is warm, usually 82 degrees for rainbow, and not letting them get eaten. So in that same theme of not letting it get eaten, you can see all these baby, let's see if we can find a group of them. They all hide together. Let me get up here so we can look at them. All right, so, uh, oh, the net's stuck. I dropped the net last time. Do, do, do. All right, let's get me, oh, there was a baby in the net even. But if we move like the Choya wood, you can see all these baby green dragon ple plecos. Um, here we go. And these are about a month old now. About a month old now. And, uh, yeah, so there's a green dragon there. Right now they look like brown dragons. <laughs> um, some have longer fins, some don't. Let's see if we can focus in on all the ones across here. But they can have litters of like 100 babies. And as long as you don't, they don't get eaten, which they were getting eaten by my Corydoras when they were small, uh, they're really easy to raise. So I'm putting them in the second from easiest. Uh, rainbows also, uh, everything except the Pseudomagill. So Pseudomagill means it has the blue eyes, and uh, they're like the Aru2s, like these guys, and uh, Luminatus, the reddish-orange ones. Those are all really, really easy. You throw a mop in there, and overnight you feed them first thing in the morning. And in the afternoon, we'll pull this mop and see how many eggs are in it um, from just two females. And I, I pulled it really recently, so... If there's not any, that's not a huge surprise, but it also wouldn't surprise me if we get some eggs out of this mop. So let me pull this mop, drain it real quick. Pull the mop, setting it down. We'll let that dry while we talk about a couple other things. Hold on, let me check the chats here. Um, I'm wondering if Pro, uh, help me get rid of snail leeches. I'm still battling in one of my tanks. Is it safe to use on a planted tank? All the anti-planaria, anti-protozoa, anti-worm stuff is safe to use on uh, tanks as far as plants and things go. However, you frequently will kill your snails and sometimes can kill your shrimp. Really, I have used Levamisol in low dose, and then um, the other one, which is, uh, I'm really spacing out on it right now. It's the most common one. Um, Betsy will type it for me. I know she will. Uh, the common dog dewormer that everyone uses. Uh, puh, sort of the P or D. I can't remember. Uh, she'll say it for me in a minute, but... Um, yeah, so in this tank, you can see I've also got um, some baby uh, re uh, ruby tetras and, compared to the adults. And I'm raising them up. Um, Pankersi, that was, yeah, um, Furin, Furin 2. Um, it's not Prozzi. There's another one. Um, in any case... All the normal fish ones that you can find at little fish stores will um, do kind of... Fen Bend is all, thank you, Swag Skywalker. You are my Jedi. You are my hero. Fen Bend is all, or uh, Fena Bend is all. There's a few different um, variations of that. 
but that is uh, the one I use first and then if that doesn't work I'll hit it again with um, Levamisol which you'll need a prescription for or just like a loosey goosey local fish store that doesn't worry about it and has like a farm license or a breeder license that allows them to have that um, so right now let me show you what I'm doing here so as we're talking uh, the eggs that I pull from the mop I put in here for the Aru2s which are rainbow fish and they're the more difficult rainbow fish not because of anything in particular there's more eggs in here too uh, but you've got your dwarf neon rainbows your thread fins and all your big large uh, rainbows if you put a spawning mop in there they're gonna make babies every day, especially if you have a tank that's really bare like this and you just have a mop every day that you check that thing within 24 hours of being left alone, they will probably have babies uh, or eggs that are in there and fertilized. And I, I, I think that that's really easy. Plecos, same deal. If you have a few plecos, uh, especially ancestrous that are adults, so I'm talking three to five, six inches, and with rubber lips and stuff, I'm talking over a foot, they will breed anywhere with a cave if you just give them some time. Some pairs get uh, do it more than often. These ones won't stop. So what, no way to get better than to do. I'm a glass artist, so I could make you some centers to play with, with be like a mouth or moving till, I'm sorry, I'm really confused by that Jeff Griffin, but, um, maybe you're talking to someone else. Okay, I'm going to keep going. So, Zebra Daniels, also very easy to uh, breed. What you would do is you would take the males and females. Uh, and for Bristlenose, I would wait till they're three to four inches, if not bigger, to breed. Um, let's live this gal, because I know I do it every live stream, and they get all cranky. You might see the other catfish in here that are never going to breed. Um... But yeah, so there's actually some babies still hiding in there. But this is a big guy. He's six inches. I don't know where his wife is. She might be... Is she hiding back here? No. I don't know. I give them lots of hiding spots. So, I would consider them... Uh, these guys, you know, they're a couple years old. They're three years old, probably. They're eating green beans, living like kings. Uh, the females will need uh, food, but males more so. Oh, there's the female, if you can see her in there, kind of. You can see her nose and an eye. Um, but basically, the, the male needs more energy than the female. She makes 100 eggs, which is, you know, it's difficult, but they grow from little teeny eggs. The male will sit in the cave and not leave for five to six days. And so that is where he needs his energy. Now, any breeding tank for grow out, I always keep a layer of, you know, duckweed, salvinia, um, hornwort, something like that over at least half of it. And a lot of times I'll just let plants float that I'm growing out and stuff like that. But it allows the younger ones like this to work their way through and hide, as well as shrimp. Believe it or not, with these catfish that will eat a shrimp in a second, uh, there are still some shrimp surviving and a group of babies that survived in here. We also have other eggs in here, but I don't know how viable or what they are. Um, I could pull them out, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. So all of my breeding goes on in a 20 gallon 40 gallons are the standard for like pleco breeding usually but a 20 gallon works just fine and then i also use the top of the water for either a um, killifish or uh endler grow out tank um basically so you can make it work if you have to my wife definitely wouldn't want 40s as the stack here so any advice on making my baby shrimp survival rate go up? I have rock piles and moss. Do you have fish in the tank? Is that what's going on? Um, you don't need rock piles and moss so much if you don't have... Are green dragons easy to sex? Yes, they are once they're adults. Babies, uh, everything up to a couple years. 
or everything up to a year, it gets a little tricky. See, there's some blue shrimp. Let's get this out of the way. Blue shrimp just chilling. These are Lucas's. Just chilling. I throw a couple babies everywhere because I like blue shrimp. But you see that snout with all the bristles? That And there's one of his babies. That's how you can tell that the gender is he's long and he's got bristles. Uh, some of them are insane. He's got very minimal bristles. Now the female, if she'll hold still, she looks like this. She doesn't have bristles so much. And she's sleeker, and if you were to look at her from above, she's less broad-headed than he is, but a little broader down the whole body. So, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely what Betsy just said. We have a sister group or brother group or non-gender binary group, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Um, on Facebook that Betsy is awesome at taking care of and moderating and all that jazz and basically if you have questions we can help you out more there and uh it's just a great place to share pictures and things like that i've had a hard time because typing and even reading these questions right now i'm having double vision so i have to close one eye now there's another baby um, I noticed babies, even if they don't survive at as high of a rate, you can grow out babies in a tank with very dangerous other fish, like fish that are going to for sure eat them. And if you have a hundred babies and you don't care necessarily, you're going to get the strongest, the biggest, and for some reason in this tank, the darkest uh, babies survived even though there are a couple fish in here that just eat them for lunch. The, the quarries, we're going to eat them. So let's talk about quarries really quick. Um, what substrate do you use in the sand-looking tank? This one here, this is fluorite, coarse sand, and a little bit of um, coral. And this is sand, coarse sand from National Geographic and pea gravel. Now, the pea gravel on its own really gets nasty. Like, it smells real bad when you va vacuum it, um, gravel vac it. But just gravel vac sections because you suck out, like, all the beneficial bacteria in an area really easily. So I do that in sections. Each week I'll pick, like, a third and do a third of it and get that out of there. But root tabs, things like that, not a good idea in pebbles, uh because yeah um scarlet battis uh we should talk about that um because they'll they'll be in with these medium hard ones and the reason they're hard so let's finish this uh peacock guns all you need is like this would work this hollow choya wood that would work i've bred peacock gudgeons unintentionally upstairs about two dozen times and I just let their babies get eaten because they're really mean and I don't like them. Um, now for quarry cats, the trick for getting quarry cats to breed, some people don't need to do anything to their tank. Other people need a clear bottom tank and it depends on the species, but naturally they lay their eggs in warm sand at night. And so what you're looking for, I have a video on this, is you look for a fat female swimming upwards or swimming sideways sorry and males running with their nose and hitting her in the belly um and basically that is what uh my oh my pink ram's horns yeah i've got all sorts of ram's horns now i've got black ram's horns gold ram's horns uh opal where, where are the opal ones? I'm trying to separate them by tank, but it's kind of like I'm, when I move plants, it switches everything up. Um, there's more gold down here. Uh, in any case, we'll talk about ram's horns another time because that's like breeding. There's one of the gold, gold and red ram's horns. There's the black and clear, and then there's the black and leopard. Um, or green and leopard, some of them now. Uh... But that is really easy. When breeding peacock gudgeons, is there anything you would recommend as tank mates? I would not keep anything in the tank, honestly. They get really, um, really moody 
and they defend their little burrow to the death, literally. Like, mine jumped out of their tank. Hold on, I'm just going to wash my hands here. Mine jumped out of their tank and down into a shrimp tank and literally killed hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of shrimp of mine. Um, oh, I was going to show you. The other thing for Danios. So Danios, they're pretty easy. What you have to do is learn to sex them. And so, and I'll show you white clouds too, because that's another good one. And, and basically, if you're here for these ones, we can talk about them briefly too. But if you're here for them, you probably need books and things rather than just this video. So we'll just touch on them. Uh, but basically, I keep, so these are all three males, and I'm keeping them apart for probably a week. Those are females, and with the RU2s, they've got fat bellies, and I will be feeding them live food. Now, this is critical. You feed them live food, you let the water get to 80 degrees or so, or 82 degrees, and that shows them, and if you can, even lowering the water. I've done that in this tank. I've let the water just evaporate down to halfway, and that takes pressure off of them. The water gets warmer, and it lets them know that the um basically that the dry season is there and things are getting kind of dire and they better hurry up and mate when they do get the chance and so then what you do and this works with a lot of fish corridoras this works like a charm then you throw in a bunch of cold water and you add 25 percent back to the tank so it's almost full like this and then you put the males and females together you plop in a grate like this one here that I made. Uh, there's the grate that came with it, but they could sneak through it. So I added some knitting needlepoint stuff. You set that in there like that, and they for sure will lay baby, will lay eggs. Then it's on you what you want to do with the eggs. Do you want to get them out of there and put them alone in a tank with nothing? Do you want to put them in a shrimp tank? But Danio eggs hatch in these these are gold eye um, or gold ring Danios and then there's one twin -y, twin eye Danio and same with the females there's one twin eye and two gold rings um, and I'm gonna put them all together and then I'm just gonna throw their eggs into the shrimp tanks so the shrimp can eat their eggs but they'll be floating like this, so hopefully they won't. When you see them, they'll come out and they'll just be eating yolk for a couple days. So you won't need to feed them anything. But they hatch really quick, like two days. And that's how I'm going to be doing it. Because then I can use this tank for all of the other things I wanted to use it for uh, very quickly again. Plus there's all these guys growing out in it. And they would eat eggs like no tomorrow. They can sell them and find them instantly. Ooh, somebody snuck out. I see another Daniel. Oh, it's okay, as long as it's a female. I'll have to double check that after the live stream. It looks like a female. They've got fatter bellies. Uh, zebra Daniels are easiest. Then I would say that the chain Daniels, so like Kayeth Daniel, Daniels, stuff like that. This female uh, live bear, Endler, is about to give birth. You can see the mix I have in here. I need to give some of these away soon and just keep the ones that I really like, plus the females that are really reliable. Um, for the Corys, though, same deal as with the Danios. Pour cold water in. They think that means it's the start of the rain season. You can put catapa leaves in while you're priming them when you keep males and females apart. Corys are a little bit harder, but Corys, the females, tend to be bigger and have... A belly full of eggs so that's a little bit fatter breast like stomach and breast area and so if you can split them up try to do that but then they'll be going up and down all over the place and if you can keep them in murkier water like with tannins and stuff that will even help your chances but with most species like um uh, Sturbeyes and Juliais and Aeneas and all those common ones, um, pygmies, all that stuff, they will simply just do it on their own. You don't need to do all the 
like faking the wet and dry season. So they'll do it and then you'll see them going up and down making a tea. I have another video on that. But then you'll see little eggs on the glass and you just take those little eggs, try not to touch them with your hands because you got bacteria. And then uh, you can just use like uh, a little, um, little something or other. If you have a pipette, that works great. And then you can put them even in just like floating something like this, but change the water daily because this will get a bacteria or a biofilm otherwise. And then those eggs will hatch shortly. Now the other way to hatch Daniels, and I'm going to show you guys this because this is another way you can do the white clouds and you can do the zebra Daniels and the CPDs and other quarries. So tetras, let me just briefly tell you about tetras. I kind of did upstairs. What you do for tetras is you cut the tank in half in that there's a net. And the tetras can only hang out up top and the eggs fall through. And you let them just hang out for a week or whatever. And then you pull all the tetras out of there. And it's as simple as that, but the babies are very teeny and you really need to feed them right, which means you have the microfauna, the plankton, the algae, all that, and you have infusoria, which is green water. Now, you can make green water. Uh, this is a real crash course. I know I'm rushing through this, but I can speak today, and I'm so excited that I can speak uh, that I'm really sticking with this. Uh, so to make infusoria, the easiest way that I've come across, get water from your dingiest tank and uh, basically get some lettuce or cabbage, boil that, pull that out, and then don't boil the tank water, sorry. Boil the cabbage and lettuce, pull it back out, and then throw it in a jar with some fish tank water and leave it in the, in the sun in the windowsill or something for a couple hours and you will undoubtedly have bacteria baby protozoa stuff like that growing so here's a mop right now before we go outside and look at my my other breeding project this was the ru2 mop i'm just gonna find one or two eggs if i can and show you what they look like size wise and color and all that jazz now, you'll get snails eating. See the snail? And this is a sign that there's not much uh, hardness in my water. I'm in Seattle. But the snails are a sign that they're eating. Get off. <laughs> uh, they're eating the eggs, usually. But here is an egg, if we can find it, right here. Usually the unfertilized eggs, you can't tell for sure, but usually unfertilized eggs have... A, a clear color whereas you get a yellow color like see this yellow there kind of like an amber color that is showing that the egg is fertile the male has fertilized it and so some of these I put up into various dishes and things like up here um, and then others now I'm trying out just putting them straight into here and seeing if the shrimp will eat them. I kind of want to build a little protection vial where the shrimp can't get in, but once these guys hatch, they can get out. But this shrimp tank method worked great for, I didn't even have to feed them. If you've got a good shrimp colony going, the leftovers that shrimp don't eat in that tank are great for fry. You don't have to do a darn thing. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, usually I get with two female RU2s. These are from Gary Lang. Handed them to me himself, which is awesome. Uh, usually I, I will pull out of a mop like this. These guys... The females will do one egg to uh, to ten eggs a day, and they need protein to make those eggs, uh, whereas the males barely need anything to fertilize the eggs, so the women need time to recover. Here's another egg, and it is very amber color. So it's probably a good sign that this egg here, and I do have bacteria on my hands, obviously. But I'm just showing you this. Yes, I do just tanks. I do sell rainbows from time to time, but I'm going to try setting this right in the duckweed and seeing 
well, it fell. So it's falling, falling, falling. It'll probably get eaten by a shrimp down there. But I'm trying some new things because I think if you can get nature to raise it and I don't have to fiddle with water changes every day and I can not have to feed them and they take care of planaria and hydra and all the like little nasties in the tank that annoy me, uh, why wouldn't I raise them that way? And that's, that's the same with tetras and the things that are harder on this list. Tetras, and I say black water, um, yes, Vex, Vex and Cat, I am just about getting there uh, with you. Um, the marbles thing, we will talk about it. Because that is the last part of the Daniel raising. Um, but yeah, so anything that you want that lays, that's an egg scatterer or an egg attacher, things that uh, attaches eggs to reeds and things like that, you can leave in a mop. Now, certain fish, these guys lay one egg a day up to like five or six or whatever. And therefore, I check the mop because they like to eat what is on the mop. And that is annoying. Hold on. But, um, I will be, um, definitely, I will be taking some mops like this one where I can put something in here tonight if I want like that's been separated upstairs like I've got those fire Daniels they'll I mean they could pick something like this but usually they'll pick whatever has the most cover and so they will lay there but they will lay a whole bunch now also another trick for um, fish that like algae and things like that when they're young Get this knitting stuff and just throw a bunch in your tank. It'll grow algae just like the walls, and it's just a good feeding place for babies. Um, but let's go outside um, and take a look at what I'm doing outside right now. Uh, so this, the the erythromyces, angelfish, all that stuff, I like raising by putting uh, a thing out. Pardon if I lose you lose my um, signal. But I like breeding those not as in sterile in a tank like, like uh, a lot of people do. You can read up on that. But I like breeding them uh, just with really thick underbrush, putting two adults in, no other fish in the tank, and then yanking them out, which is, as Lucas says, musical fish. So now what I've done, I've used the really natural method here outside, but these are white cloud minnows, and I have used... Um, rocks that are all jagged and there's lots of spots for the rocks to for eggs to fall so when these white cloud minnows inevitably each morning spawn uh, they will fall somewhere in between these rocks hopefully where they cannot be eaten then the adults will eat whatever comes. Don't eat a ton of their young, but like Daniels will eat a lot of their young. A lot of fish will eat a lot of their young. Tetras, they don't care at all. They'll eat all their young. Um, angelfish, they'll eat their young. Lots of fish will eat their young. Um, some angelfish exhibit more cichlid things, uh, patterns, and don't, but as a general rule, if it fits in their mouth, it shifts. <laughs> it, it, it gets chipped. So, basically, the old-fashioned way, or the way that most people used to breed fish, was they would put marbles in. Two inches of marbles. You can also go to Ikea and get those glass beads or whatever. By the way, this is tank water and old tank gravel, and that is just growing um, nymphs and anything that wants to lay eggs in there, mosquitoes or whatever, and that feeds this tank. Um, as well as bugs that just get trapped on the water. And there's nothing better for it. Today it's 92 degrees out, and this is in the shade. And so this tank stays in the shade and gets maybe, I don't know, four hours of sun in the day. But live food is very important. Uh, used to use slate with angels. Yes, you can use slate, definitely. Um, you can do that for Corydoras, too. Um, a lot of different fish like to attach to slate instead of glass, but you can't always predict. So usually 
check out the slate and the glass. Anything you see that's a cluster of eggs, it's not snail eggs. Snail eggs usually have um, like a clear goo all around the whole thing, whereas a lot of times fish eggs don't. They just are a bunch of little teeny eggs that get stuck. Uh, keeping well, still haven't started breeding my Rasbora Kubota yet. Need to get the numbers up. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would like to see you raise the Resboras. They're great, but you need Infusoria, and you need to keep them away from... So it's kind of like they're, they can be one of those ones that's seasonal. So that's that are extreme. So a lot of fish that live in places that get super dry, and they start to live in basically mud puddles and most die, their cue to breed is when the rain comes. And so... Uh, that is what when you will see you do a cold water change to represent you know it's been baking in the sun in these puddles these poor fish all together the ph is off the charts the acidity is off the charts and all of a sudden they get wash of clean water and new mates that are fat and healthy and overfed that have come from other rivers and that's what you're imitating but the marbles Essentially, when breeding any nano fish, what you're doing is you're first giving them conditioning. So, could you leave quarry eggs with two week old quarries? Yeah, with two week old quarries, you'd probably be okay. So, let me just put it like this because I'm running out of steam. Uh, but with breeding, uh, you want to leave, you want to leave. Uh, conditioning so that means plants or that means marbles or whatever you're conditioning the environment then you condition the fish so conditioning the fish usually means feeding them live food now feeding them live food giving them good reliable cycles of light good hiding spots so that they're comfortable and oftentimes splitting up the males from females that is any breeding process that makes it go quicker. It's more reliable when you split up the males and females if you can tell them apart. Granted, like with live bears, don't need to do that. Don't worry. If they've seen each other for a half hour, they're pregnant. Uh, but like these Daniels here, uh, I'm waiting, but I know that's a, well, I know one's a female for sure. Two's, two are females for sure. The other ones, I don't know if they're young or male or what the deal is. But uh, once I do, I'll set them aside, and then we'll probably try the marble thing just to be on, um, yeah. Uh, so what you would do is, like that bear tank I have up or downstairs, you would fill it with marbles, like yay high. Marbles are expensive now, though, so I'd get those Ikea little flat things, unless you have a dollar store where you can get some. Um, you could use rocks that are round too, but marbles are great because they really do leave a lot of empty space for the eggs to settle in. And you're not doing any gravel cleaning, none of that. Uh, and basically, yeah, the dollar store. And basically, so you've primed your fish, you've fed them well. Another thing that people overlook is you prime your fish by putting infusoria in the tank start putting vinegar eels or baby brine or whatever uh, ted judy's tank method for egg scatterers is awesome yes i mentioned it very briefly today by talking about with tetras and things how you can uh, cordon off a tank like here and you can put like a five gallon and a 40 gallon here and then like a strainer so that the eggs drop uh, check out Lucas Brett's channel for some details on how Ted Judy does that. And even Lucas, like, put them together. So check out LRB Aquatics for that. Um, but, yeah, so just condition them to have live food. Even if they don't need it, even if the fish you're breeding don't need it, they look around the, their habitat and they think, are my babies going to survive? Do my babies have food? That's why you feed them live food. It's not necessarily that they need it, even though a lot of times it's good for them too. It's that it tells them that nature will provide for their babies. Um, no, cherry shrimp don't tend to eat microworms or much at all that's alive. 
Uh, they tend to eat dead things. They may eat dead microworms if there's protein in them, uh, but usually microworms just clutter up the tank of a cherry shrimp tank. See, this guy's probably going to get cold. He's too tangerine -y, clear, tan, blonde, not yellow enough. So that's what I have to say about yellow shrimp when someone asked earlier, too. Like, just keep an eye on them. He's a male, too, so you don't want that gene spreading. Now, you want to give males a little bit of credibility uh, that their colors aren't going to be as strong as females, but um, not too far. You should get a sense by looking at the the scope of it all. But yeah, so uh, as was said earlier, check out Ted Judy's method. So we're gonna we're gonna talk that we talked about that. We talked about uh, preparing your fish by feeding them right, uh, showing them like whether it's hot water and no water changes for a couple weeks. And then doing a bunch of water changes or one big cold water change for Corydoras and Danios and things. And then uh, they're ready to mate. So then next comes, what are they going to mate on? Are they just going to have a drop screen? Are they going to have a natural, just really thick area here? Like these guys would be able to lay eggs, no problem, anything. Tetras, whatever, can lay eggs here, but most will get eaten due to the openness. So if I let this grow in almost completely where you can't see a single fish, then maybe 10% of the tetras would survive or something, maybe 5%. So that's where he comes in, knowing how big the babies will be, having a screen that size. And the easiest way to deal with all of that is just assume that after you've split up males and females and you put them back together, and if you can't do that for sure, get tubs like one, two, three, four, just anything like this and just set it out overnight they'll be fine uh and put water in there and put one tetra two tetra three tetra four tetra whatever and uh, if you have airlines that's great but just set them there for a couple days change the water every 12 hours or every whatever this is lucas's new method for bettas and things like that um but that's also the way that Dexter's world does it. If you check out his the Filipino off-the-grid style way of doing things, then you put them all together. They're all excited to be together, and boom, they go at it. So, um, no, I have not had bloodfin tetras. I've not done. I've not raised them. I'm sorry. I may, Lucas might have. I know he's got the mus mascara barbs and the heart tetras, bleeding heart tetras, I think it was, or something. Or maybe he couldn't do those, I don't remember. Unless you have cats, my cats would tap dance through that. Yeah. Uh, would broken baby brine be a waste of time? No. Uh, baby brine, infusoria, vinegar eels, all that stuff, Daphnia, anything like that, even if it's too big for the actual babies, that's great to condition the fish for like a two-week period that there's going to be babies. And baby brine are great. Like a lot of fish can eat those, even though they're too small for so, or they're too big for some fry, but they're good for a lot. So once you've got them conditioned, they lay their eggs. It's a matter of do I just pull the parents out or what? And also when they lay their eggs, you decide: Am I going to have a screen and they lay their eggs through that? Am I going to have a mop and I clean the mop, or I pull the mop out and put it in a new tank? Or am I going to use plants and keep it all together in a colony, you know, or marbles and then pull the adults? Um, and then quarry cats, what do you feed them after hatching? Yeah, egg yolks from boiled eggs, that works. Um, infusoria, as I was saying, works really well. Just put some cabbage or lettuce, boil it, then get some tank water screw a top on, poke a couple holes in it, put it on the windowsill, and just let it turn into green water. Any algae green water is awesome for fry. If you look at a lot of people's channels that share that, like Lucas, the best stuff, yeah, broccoli works great. Uh, Mark's Shrimp Tanks, he does that, Mark's Aquatics. Um, you can uh, basically just uh, any tank that's super dark and looks cycled and covered in algae, 
Fry will love it. So if you don't have any adults in there and you have one tank that's just all janky and needs to be cleaned and everyone's like, oh, what's wrong with that tank? As long as the ammonia and the nitrites are good, go ahead and put your fry in there and in a few months they'll be adults and they'll grow faster than everyone. All right, guys. Well, I hope that I could answer some of the questions. I'm having a hard time keeping up with them still right now, but I feel like I held it together pretty good for this. I got some cool tick, tri t uh, tips and tricks for you guys coming up in the future. We're going to do some history stuff that's going to be a little more down to earth. And uh, thank you guys so much for the support um, with medical bills with keeping the fish room alive and uh, all of that uh, I hope that um, we can all teach each other all learn from each other and all take care of each other um, that's what the fish fan things about online and the internet has really allowed nerds in the basement who have a secret uh, love of fish maybe a little more than your average person keeping a community fish tank or having someone else take care of it uh, we love it because we play with destiny of the little fish. And if you're like me, you like breeding them, you like, um, you like uh, planting and propagating and seeing the, the work you've laid grow into something beautiful. Uh, last chance for a super chat, even a buck or two helps. Thank you. Um, Betsy, I appreciate that. It uh, goes a long way. You always help, and you are a sweetheart. I'm sorry your lily didn't survive, but Lucas still hasn't opened his, so hopefully tonight we'll see a live stream with that, and it'll be okay. Uh, also, um, subscribe, like, share if there's something helpful here. I know it's a live stream, but I figured I'd just do a solid hour of tips on what to raise in what order if you haven't done it yet. Just a real brief overview and then we'll do videos of like, this is the Daniels, this is the... But just to kind of give you an idea of what you're getting into before you start. And then there's all sorts of things like discus and the Tatia catfish that I have that need a pH of 3.8 and they need water to go up and then down and then up again in pH and in hardness and in temperature. So there's all sorts of stuff um, that can play and have an effect. Oh, Jack LaMountain, another $10 super chat. I really appreciate that, man, because anything on this channel, like I said, I want to get a better camera. I want to get a mic so we can interview people. Um, that is so sweet of you, very nice of you. I hope that maybe I can save you money by sharing some of my knowledge, and you guys do the same to me. And um, when I have money, I try to you know do the same and Patreon and all that. Um, but I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I also understand if you don't have money to spare right now, so many of us don't in the hobby life you know a lot of people are working a day job and two or three side hustles and i get it fish and shrimp are your escape and let them be that and let's just love each other so all right you guys take care ask questions in the comments in the facebook group and i hope uh <laughs> thank you very much um and I, uh, yeah, I'm not able to work for a while. Like, I'm crashing now. Um, I get so bad that I, like, get confused where I am still. Hopefully that will end as swelling from the, like, traumatic brain injury part of the concussion or the throw. I'm hoping that that's what that's from. But there's a neurological end of it that is totally uncertain like the hallucinations and the like weird word mix-ups and stuff like that like i know what's going on but i can't communicate it and like the writing on this this piece of paper here is actually with my left hand some of it because my right hand was taking too long well you guys saw it um but that's the best i've done in days so that gives me hope too so you guys give me hope my wife gives me help. I can't thank her enough. Uh, take it slow. I like that. 
All right, guys. Well, I'm done yakking about how much I appreciate you and the GoFundMe and all that. And the links are below. I think the link to the Facebook group where you can post your own videos and pictures and share knowledge, which we love, should be linked below. Uh, if not, just search for it. Um, it's just the Secret History Living in Your Aquarium uh, Facebook group. But much love to you guys, much appreciation. Good luck with your breeding. Good luck with your tanks. Take care of yourselves so you can take care of others around you. Spread the love. Spread the joy. And I'll talk to you later. Swim on.